good afternoon because that's what it is for me but uh good morning for those of you on the east coast and good very early good morning for those on the west coast and those in japan welcome for having got up in the middle of the night we're very grateful um we're going to start this first of all by uh listening to eskil from the IPB Berlin office, who's going to give us some housekeeping rules. Eskil? Hello, everyone. Uh, well, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, if you want to ask a question, we ask that you please use the hands function. Uh, if you don't know how to use that, all you have to do is pretty simple. You click on participants at the bottom, and then you will find a couple of, uh, well, three little dots at the bottom of the participants panel. You click that. Uh, and you just click raise hand, or it will be in whatever language uh, you have your Zoom in. Uh, it could also pop up in its own separate uh, box. Same thing, uh, bottom right, three dots, raise hand. It's that simple. And uh, uh, we will then get to you and you can ask your question or, or say a comment uh, or whatever it might may be. Uh, if you don't want to appear on camera, of course, feel free to drop a question or comment uh, in the chat. Uh, and that's everything. Uh, thank you all. Thank you, Westkill. Now, uh, my name is Lisa Clark, and I'm the, one of the co-presidents of the International Peace Bureau. The other one is Philip Jennings, who's here somewhere, but uh, I, I don't think we can see him yet. I'm sure he'll appear on the video pretty soon. Uh, as you've seen, as you came to join this uh, webinar, uh, we're, we are wondering and asking some of our uh, US peace activist friends and comrades and campaign activists, fellow campaign activists, uh, what the Biden-Harris victory is going to mean for peace in the world, if they can help us start thinking about this and start understanding this. Naturally, uh, when, when the victory was announced after several days, it was, there was a big sigh of relief on the part of all of us. Um, most of us in the rest of the world are not privileged enough to vote in that election, although the election makes a big difference in all of our lives. So we really want to know and we feel that uh, um, we need to know from people that we trust and people who work with us on our campaigns. And that's why we've put together this group of uh, uh, excellent peace activists. We will talk together with Joseph Gerson, who is also a vice president of the IPB, the Campaign for Peace, Disarmament and Common Security. And then we will hear from Emily Rubino, who is also on the board, or is she on the council? I can't remember, of the IPB. Council. Um, a young member on the council of the IPB, who is from Peace Action New York State. Then we will hear from Donasia, uh, from Black Lives Matter Boston chapter. And I'd like to remind you all that Black Lives Matter as an organization this year was awarded the IPB's Sean McBride Prize. And uh, lastly, we will hear from Paul Kawika Martin, who is the Senior Director for Policy at Peace Action. And uh, we, we welcome them all. We're very grateful that at such short notice they could all be here and devote some time to us. So I think you don't want to hear from me, you want to hear from them. And then there would be plenty of time for questions and answers, which I shall try and moderate to the best of my ability. Joseph, would you start? Off we go. So thank you, Lisa. And I want to thank Reiner for thinking to, to do this and for the IPB staff for stepping up to make it possible and, and my, 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 my co-speakers here. Uh, thank you very much. Um, first of all, just to say that um, when, when uh, Biden's victory was announced, you know, there were spontaneous demonstrations all across the United States. Uh, and and a, a sense, uh, it's, it's been compared to what it was like uh, in, in Chile when Pinochet, the dictator, uh, was finally ousted. Uh, a, a, huge, a huge sense of relief, which was not to say that we expected uh, Nirvana to come the next, the next day. Uh, and you know, just by way of, of uh, a couple of details, to say we, we had you know, the record turnout uh, with Biden winning a record 74 million votes, uh, but the problem uh, in that uh, Trump received uh, 70 million votes, more than uh, any, any presidential candidate had received before. Uh, and, 
and we have 70% of Republicans uh, now believing uh, that, uh, that there was fraud, that, that Biden won because of, of fraud. Um, we have a situation, and, and just to say that uh, there have been hopes that the Democrats would take the, the Senate, uh, which is essential for uh, passing legislation. Uh, that didn't happen. We now have a major fight, uh, two, two Senate elections in Georgia, uh, which will determine uh, the balance of power uh, in, in, in Washington to a considerable degree. Um, I, I need to say that um, it's not over. It's not over yet. Um, we have a, a situation where Trump has yet to concede, uh, where Barr has initiated uh, federal investigations uh, of, of a possible voting fraud, which, uh, as you can see in today's New York Times, uh, there is absolutely no evidence of um, of, of, of the fraud, uh, but it, or any fraud, uh, but it's it's widely believed. Uh, we have uh, Pompeo, who yesterday uh, said that um, there would be a smooth uh, transition, peaceful transition of power from the first uh, Trump administration to the second. Uh, and the Trump, Trump uh, administration is not providing the kind of uh, resources or access to the, the government that is normal uh, in a transition of, of, of power. Uh, I was up a bit last night after getting a note from, uh, from Noam Chomsky saying the outcome is much in doubt. The Republicans and the administration are openly preparing a virtual coup and the outcome is not certain. That said, my source of hope uh, is, uh, interestingly, we have this, this, this uh, very right-wing Supreme Court, uh, but even yesterday uh, they, were, um, they were breaking from, from, from Trump uh, over his efforts to get rid of uh, Obamacare and throw 20 million people out of healthcare. So, there is hope that even if it goes to Supreme Court, Trump might not prevail. Uh, so anyhow, to, to then move in to say our, our, our crisis is, uh, is deeply rooted in, in US history and others I think will, will speak about that. Um, the, the, talk, the, the, the talk here was framed as um, Biden's implications for, uh, for peace. And I think we need to be very clear uh, that Biden is not a peace president. Um, his, his articulated priorities at this point are fighting the virus, uh, racial equality, and, and climate change. And we don't see really much uh, from him now or during the campaign in terms of foreign and military uh, policy. Um, I think it's best understood, the, the Biden administration is best understood as sort of a third Obama administration, but facing uh, new, uh, new circumstances. Uh, and you know, principal among them uh, being China's rise and the uh, relative decline of the United States accelerated uh, by, uh, by, by Trump. Um, what I wanna say here, okay. Uh, Paul will say more about it, but just in terms of looking at who his foreign and military policy appointees uh, are likely to be, uh, the, the, the clear front runner to be the Secretary of Defense would be the first woman Secretary of Defense, Michelle Flournoy. And while in many ways women have been you know, more peaceful, nurturing, caring uh, than, than men in most cultures, uh, the reality is that Flournoy is, is very much a militarist, uh, served high positions in the uh, uh, Obama administration, uh, is committed to US military dominance uh, world, worldwide. Uh, she, her, her, her writings uh, tell us that she's not expecting massive increases in US military spending, but wants to do changes with greater um, focus uh, on investments in technology and, and development of, of, of new weapon systems. She's certainly gonna be a very hard liner in relationship to both Russia and, uh, and China. Uh, in terms of uh, the, the guy, uh, Blinken uh, is, is, uh, was Obama's uh, national security advisor when he's vice president. Uh, had a senior position uh, after that in the Obama White House. He's increasingly seen as either the national security advisor or possibly as a secretary of state. Uh, also committed to, uh, in his writings, he says, look, the United States can lead the world or someone else will, and therefore we have to. Uh, so a, a commitment to, to, to US hegemony. Um, another front runner is a woman named Susan Rice, who is national security advisor to Obama. Uh, whether she could get through uh, 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 authorization by the, by the Senate is, uh, is questionable, so she may have to have another, another position. Uh, but there are others, uh, Senator Chris Coons and, and Chris Murphy, 
uh, also vying for that position with Murphy being the, the most progressive among them. Um, all right, then kind of looking around the world a bit. Um, what we have with, with Biden is a restoration of commitment to multilateral uh, uh, implementation of, of, of US hegemony and, 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 and that order. I think we need to be clear that Trump was not an isolationist. Uh, Trump's idea of America first was more uh, unilateralist, uh, not wanting to be encumbered uh, by, by alliances uh, and, and having to deal with, with, with uh, other nations. So what we'll have from a Biden administration will be a refocusing on, on, on revitalizing alliances. Uh, primary among them, we'll look to uh, NATO, uh, the, what's now called the Quad uh, in Asia Pacific, which is the United States, Japan, uh, uh, Australia, and India uh, to contain uh, China. Uh, we are likely to see uh, a possible reinforcement of the World Trade Organization, and we need to understand the economic dimensions of, of, of foreign policy. Uh, clearly, he'll be seeking uh, greater international cooperation uh, on uh, the pandemic and climate change, uh, rejoining the Paris uh, uh, Agreement uh, on climate, uh, and um, uh, rejoining uh, the World Health Organization. Uh, we're going to see a uh, continued focus on building up military and uh, other power in Asia Pacific uh, to understand that this didn't begin with, um, with Trump. Uh, it didn't begin with Obama. And it goes back to about the year 2000 uh, with the, um, uh, first, the second Bush administration uh, and the idea of deploying perhaps as much as 60% of US military power uh, to the region. Uh, building the network of alliances using the bases uh, and you know to see the increased uh, uh, pressure to contain China. Understand that the perception is that we're in the classical Thucydides trap uh, with the United States being a country in decline, an empire in decline, and China a, a rising uh, force. Um, uh, and we have really quite considerable uh, continuity there uh, really since um, at least since, since 1945, uh, US policy across the Asia Pacific region has been largely led uh, by, by the Navy. Uh, I was on an interesting um, webinar the other day with a former top Japan figure from the W. Bush administration uh, talking about policy. Uh, and what he was saying, interestingly, and this will maybe interest uh, uh, Emmy, uh, is that you know, Japan has a grand strategy, uh, which we don't think about very much, and that being maritime strategy to contain China uh, while cooperating economically uh, better with, with China uh, than the US. And, and his, his, his belief was that you know, we, we already have, you know, with the air, uh, air sea battle plan and the uh, military buildup with the quad, the US in some ways kind of following Japan's lead, but of course much more powerful and making demands on, on Japan as it goes. Uh, and of course, we do expect more cooperation uh, with, with China. Uh, Biden will likely back off of the trade war a little bit. Um, you know, some of the big financial interests behind him uh, want access to the China market. So it'll, it'll, be, it'll be complex, uh, but, but, but nasty in many ways. Uh, of course, re reinvigorating alliances means NATO uh, continue and in perhaps even increase the confrontation with Russia. At the same time, we can expect that uh, if, if Trump doesn't renew New START uh, before he leaves, that Biden likely uh, will. Um, but we're also going to see um, uh, you know, the, the continued movement of the deployment of the B-61-12s to Europe. And we're going to see uh, increased challenges, I think, to Russian influence, uh, not only in Europe, uh, but uh, around the world, certainly in Southwest Asia, North Africa, and, and elsewhere. Uh, in the Middle East, we're going to see uh, Biden uh, trying to uh, re-engage the United States with the JCPOA, the nuclear deal with, with Iran. Uh, it may not be as easy as one would hope because Iran is likely to have its demands and its expectations after the US pulled out, uh, but we'll, we'll see where that goes. One area of improvement I think we can expect uh, is that uh, we'll see a dim diminution of uh, US ties to Saudi Arabia, uh, probably an end to the arms sales uh, that have been used for the war uh, in, in Yemen. Uh, and between the combination of, of uh, wanting to re-engage with, uh, with, with Iran on the, on the nuclear deal and diminishing uh, the ties to um, Saudi Arabia, which is not to say breaking them, 
uh, that's going to make for some interesting interesting changes. Uh, Biden will, of course, be very pro-Israel, uh, but not the depth of of, of, of embrace uh, that we had with with Trump, uh, and uh, certainly uh, Netanyahu's support for, uh, for for Trump is not going to uh, lead to Biden being enamored with him. So we'll see how that plays out. And we also need to appreciate that the Democratic Party has changed now uh, over, you know, say, the last decade or more in terms of its, its composition. Comp composition. Uh, so um, uh, there's not the, you know, there's, there's increased recognition of the rights of Palestinians within the Democratic Party, and it's a little bit more complicated than it was in the past. Moving toward the end here, um, on the nuclear front, uh, I think we can expect from Trump to have uh, uh, continue with, with most of the $1.7 trillion nuclear modernization. Rice is talking especially about the need to be replacing the, um, uh, you know, the Trident subs uh, you know, with their omnicidal uh, capability, uh, but just about everything else with the exception possibly of cutting the um, land-based ICBMs uh, and the new standoff cruise, cruise missile. Uh, one area where there's, there may be some, some openings for us is Biden has in the past raised questions about the U.S. first use doctrine, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the ability and the doctrine that allows the United States to initiate nuclear war. Um, he's also pledged to have a nuclear posture review, which be a, a kind of updating of U.S. nuclear warfare, uh, war fighting doctrine. And, and that's, I think, the principal place where the fight over you know, no first use will take place. Obama had wanted to do to, to move off of first use, uh, but um, they basically wilted under pressure from, from the Pentagon. Uh, just kind of wrapping up here, uh, you know, there is the global South, uh, Latin America, uh, Africa. Uh, uh, and I think what we can expect is that Africa will not be very high on the list of, of foreign policy priorities, except uh, as the United States competes with China uh, and other capitalist countries. Uh, in terms of, of, of African resources. Uh, uh, you know, there is, we do have the, the movement, which I think will continue, of drawing down, not, not eliminating, but drawing down the number of US forces uh, in, in Africa and in Latin America uh, to reinforce the buildup in relationship to China. Um, and in, in Latin America, I think the main thrust there will be, um, you know, the change in US immigration policies that we'll, we'll see. And, you know, that's, that's certainly very welcome. Uh, and you know we'll have a less racist policy uh, toward toward Latin America, uh, but you know the, the thrust of empire goes goes forward. So with that, I'll shut up and uh, look forward to hearing what my my partners have to say. Thank you very much, Joseph. That was uh, very comprehensive and uh, uh, really very instructive for all of us on the other side of the pond. Emily. Would you like to, I introduced, I don't know if people have joined us since I introduced Emily at the beginning. Emily is the uh, from Peace Action New York State, but she's also a member of the Council of the International Peace Bureau. Emily. Great, thanks Lisa and thanks Joseph. Um, I will try to keep this on the shorter side. I know Joseph has covered a lot and I'm sure Paul will cover more of the policy stuff. So I'm kind of going somewhere in between um, all of that, um, which is to say, and I said this on Sunday as well, that I think the sense of joy and relief I feel post-election um, is not that Biden is president, but simply that Trump is not, right? Like we know that Biden is not a peace president. We know that he's not amazing on any of the issues that we really care about, but he is at least slightly less bad. Um, so I think, you know, I saw what Joseph was alluding to, the honking of the cars, the banging of pots and pans. I think that everyone needed to blow off some steam, but I've also seen mixed results of people who are still skeptical of what's going to happen next and that are kind of scared that this whole uh, return to normal or return to Obama era policies means that a lot of people who got active during the Trump administration are going to say, okay, we did it, we won we'll return to our regular privileged lives without really digging further into these issues that didn't start with Trump. And as we know, as activists are not going to end now that Trump is gone. Um, like Joseph, I'm still very alarmed by the amount of votes that Trump has gotten. 
Um, the fact that he is kind of trying to lay the groundwork for a coup, whether or not it's taken seriously or will actually happen. Um, and I think that we really need to examine the role of white supremacy and its allure in this past election, probably in all elections, uh, really need to examine the role of the electoral college system and why it was put in place um, because it has deep roots um, going back to slavery. So I think that as someone who's younger, um, I first got involved in activism and was introduced to the peace movement under the Obama administration. So I really don't have any <laughs> illusions that Biden is magically going to make our work extraordinarily easier. But I do think that for many people, it does at least change slightly the conditions that we're working under. Hopefully will give us time to, you know, build our networks and strengthen our kind of more progressive policy and push for peace. Um, it's not new to have a neoliberal president. Uh, it's nice to not have a fascist one. And I think that working with uh, so many young people who were born, you know, after our post 9-11 wars, a lot of people in my generation and younger, myself included, are pretty disillusioned by the current system. Um, I think that especially this COVID-19 pandemic has made it clear we can't just return to normal. Um, it wasn't really working for us then. It's not going to work for us now under Biden. Um, and yeah. I think that uh, no one here probably needs the reminder, but Biden voted in favor of both the 2001 and 2002 authorizations of military force, which means that they were passed before many of the students I work with were born um, and they're now old enough to enlist in the military. So um, not having concrete messaging around him wanting to repeal those authorizations is something we'll definitely need to work on. Um, Kamala Harris, who's the first woman and the first black woman vice president which is great in a lot of ways, um, is also not perfect. She has a particularly bad record around uh, trans women and sex workers and has a really mixed uh, record as attorney general. So, you know, uh, I think that means that our work as peace activists doesn't change as significantly as I wish it would with presidential elections. Um, you know, we've been working on these issues way before Trump, way before Obama, um, and we're going to continue to work on them. But I think it's the manner that we get to work under, um, hopefully not as completely frazzled, being pulled in so many directions. Um, I'm not as worried about Biden threatening to use a nuclear button or comparing it to the size of other countries' nuclear buttons. Um, so I think that they're is a difference obviously in these presidencies but i think that our work as peace activists goes beyond just presidential politics or electoral politics and what we really need is to continue to build these grassroots networks on the ground to build international solidarity so that we're not just depending on um these state structures um yeah so yeah, we've got our work cut out for us, uh, but it is nice to not be sliding further into fascism. Um, and I think that, I think there's a lot of mixed emotions with this presidency and I wish that I was more excited for it, um, but it is nice to have at least a few seconds to take a breath and have some sense of relief before we move forward. So yeah, Thank not you, the most Emily. hopeful, but. No, exactly. I was going to say that. But thank you, Emily, even though you don't give us much hope. But um, I don't know, perhaps afterwards, now is not the moment for me to ask you anything. But uh, I will later ask you something about the, uh, the, the novelties within the Democratic Party. Are they not going to have any effect on this at all? Uh, but that's something you could, we can think about later. Uh, and now I'd like to ask Donasia. I'm delighted that you could join us here, Donasia. And as I said, I'm going to repeat it because some people have joined us later. Donasia is from Black Lives Matter, Boston chapter. And I would like to remind everybody that the IPB awarded this year's Sean McBride Prize. We give a prize every year uh, to Black Lives Matter. So we're particularly glad to have Donasia with us here this afternoon. The floor is yours. Thank you. 
Um, and thank you also for your recognition with the McBride Prize. Um, I'm glad to be here um, on behalf of our movement, also on behalf of my comrade, Carlene griffith Seku, who could not make it this afternoon. Um, but unfortunately, I don't know if I'm gonna, gonna bring us in any more of a hopeful direction than Emily. I'm kind of on that same wavelength. Um, though I did personally run out of my house on Saturday. My whole neighborhood was yelling. I jumped in my car and drove downtown and joined the protests and joined the celebration and the dancing in the street. Um, and then my tires were slashed. Um, so I think that it's a, it was a very stark reminder that while we can take a, a breath and we, we do want to celebrate um, each of these, you know, small wins, the, the battle continues. Um, and that the, you know, the other side did get 72 million votes um, and they haven't gone anywhere. They're our neighbors and, and they're the people that are around us. Um, and we're stuck here with them. And so um, they are sore losers and they're gonna do sore loser things um, and continue to perpetuate the violence that they wanted to, con they wanted to see continue with, a, with another Trump administration. Um, so um, that being said, I, again, we do need to celebrate this win. I think part of um, the importance of our movement is being able to, to fight and to struggle, but also to be in joy together and to lift that as just as important as our work in the streets and our work at the ballot boxes, um, that we be in community with each other um, and be lifting each other and be supporting each other in mutual aid. Um, and so we wanna recognize the, the communities, the black folks, specifically the black women, um, Stacey Abrams, Latasha Brown, um, Tamika, I'm blanking on her last name right now, um, of Pro Georgia and the folks that really got out and made sure that we had this win. Um, and there's a lot of talk around, you know, black women saving the country and we saved ourselves <laughs> and we saved our family and we saved our community. And if that benefits the United States, then, then the United States should be lucky, um, should be so lucky, um, but that we really, have prioritized ourselves in the in the Black Lives Matter movement, which I think is very important. Um, uh, going to this, you know, idea of Kamala Harris as, um, you know, a, a representative of Black women, um, of a win in terms of um, seeing a black a black woman in a, in such a high office. That is true. That is something that people feel, and the the same way that she looks like me, so do the people that she has harmed for for years, right? So do the people that the policies that she has supported and that Biden has supported have, has harmed also look like me. Um, so it's it's definitely a, a tough spot to be in because you wanna have that pride, but it's also like, sis, you're really not it. You're really not it. And we're really gonna have to hold this administration just as accountable as any. Um, and as Emily was saying, you know, the, the Black Lives Matter movement was born under the Obama administration. And so, there's no sense that having a, a, you know, that type of identity politic um, is going to save us or, or really um, isn't really uh, the, the kind of leg up that, that people would like to believe it is. Um, the, the piece around the electoral college, I think is really important. I think that it's important that we lift up that history and that basis in slavery in the plantocracy and in, in uplifting and, and allowing people who believe they could own other people to have power. And we see that it continues to operate that way. Um, and we are lucky that it did not turn that way, but it easily could have. And for, for five days, we didn't know if it would. And that's a, that's a tragic position to be in. Um, and I, I hope also that that is, that is definitely lifted in the conversations that we have going forward that the electoral college ha has to go. Um, it doesn't make any sense in a democracy that the person who wins the popular vote would not win the election. Um, and we came very close to that not being the case. Um, that being said, also um, this, this two party system as a whole <laughs> does not work for our country, does not work for black folks. Um, I think that we saw that also in 
um, a lot of the in the in the primaries, um, in the you know the the way that Biden was put forward by the Democratic Party and supported over other candidates that had people power um, and that people were really energized about. As Emily said, I don't know anyone who was excited about Biden. I know people who are excited that Trump is out. Um, and that's a, that's a sad place to be in when we can't be excited and feel really represented by our president. Um, I do think though that there, there is hope. Um, Biden and, and Harris have both acknowledged their um, their roles in harming black communities in uh, mass incarceration specifically. Um, and I think it's important that we hold our feet to the fire around that um, and not not allow the this, this again, this back to normal. This, uh, there's been a lot of talk of compromise and of unity. Um, and as I saw a sister say uh, on the news yesterday, unity is great, but freedom is better. Um, and certain communities have been, have had our freedom taken from us time and time again for the sake of unity, for the sake of compromise, for the sake of bipartisanship. Um, and I think it's important that we don't continue that trend um, and that we really stand on our progressive values. We saw um, in the down ballot races that progressive candidates won across the board. Um, I, there's the, the candidates that supported Medicaid for all ones who did not support Medicaid for all, all lost. And ones who did, won. Um, and so I think that that's important as well to for the Democratic Party to understand that progressives got you this win, not moderates, not um, this, you know, the, the Lincoln Project or whatever. Um, it was actually people far to the left who made sure that we did not slide further into fascism. Um, the coalition building um, that was multiracial, that was um, again, locally organized um, was crucial in this case. Um, sorry, I'm losing my notes here. Sorry, yes. Um, I think that the, we are also continue to be in a, in a pandemic um, that we've seen this current administration completely ignore, ignore science, ignore facts, ignore reality. Um, and so I think there is hope that, um, you know, the Biden-Harris administration has already said that that would be a priority, um, but we definitely need um, a, an emergency plan for relief. We have, we're at 10 million cases, 240,000 deaths um, and black people, poor people, working class people have been absolutely, um, absolutely disproportionately impacted and, and, can, and honestly just left, left to die. Um, and not only, uh, and not only has it been that we haven't gotten the support that we needed, but also there's been a complete, you know, backwards presentation of, of the reality of the situation of denying the, the rates and denying the fact that there actually even is a pandemic going on. Um, so we look forward to, to having that switch um, and to being able to push um, the government to create a plan for folks um, to survive. That includes um, not only you know, the, the, the PPE and, and hospital support, but also um, evictions. Um, the Massachusetts eviction moratorium has ended um, and so has the Boston specific moratorium, but Cambridge, Massachusetts has extended their moratorium. And so again, we go back to this, the local level and being able to push our local um, politicians and local stakeholders to make decisions that work for people and extending eviction moratoriums is absolutely crucial um, because otherwise we will have millions of people on the street um, in, a, in an absolute surge in this pandemic. Um, divesting and defunding from the police um, is clearly you know, one of our major calls to action. Um, so Congressman Jim Clyburn had said that the, you know, that the defunding the police call um, hurts our movement. And I think we've seen that that is not the case. 
Um, we've seen, you know, Black Lives Matter trending very positively in the voting exit polls. Um, and also that people are really realizing the role that mass incarceration plays in our daily lives and the amount of funding that actually goes into the police when communities are not getting returned back. And that's across the board. That's Black community specifically, that's poor community specifically, that's trans and queer community specifically, but it also is all of us. Um, we are all paying taxes into a system that is using it to harm us. Um, and we've seen that time and time again in our protests um, and in the way that the, the police and the National Guard have been militarized against civilians standing up for what we believe in and practicing our First Amendment rights. Um, and so, yeah, that being said, I think the, the main piece for us is that we're not going back to normal. There, there was not normal for us. Um, and I think that, again, that that's being um, unveiled nationwide and, and internationally, that the status quo is unacceptable. Um, and we really need to be imagining a, a new way of being in the world and a new way of um, of supporting communities and of really having a government that's for the people and by the people. Thank you, that was great. I love that you, both you and Emily both stress the fact that we're not going back to normal, that going back to normal is not what we're all about. And that there, well, there wasn't much hope in your analysis, but there was hope in both of you when you said that, and you said that we're all in agreement that we're not going back to normal. That's fantastic. Well, Paul uh, Martin, Paul Kawika Martin, would you then explain to us why Kawika, because I don't happen to know that, who is the Senior Director for Policy at Peace Action. Paul, the floor is yours. Thanks, Lisa. Yeah, Kawika, um, W sounds like the V, it's Hawaiian. My grandmother was half Hawaiian, half Portuguese. Um, I really want to thank International Peace Bureau We've enjoyed decades of work together. Um, the indefatigable Reiner there, uh, Lisa and Philip. Um, thanks a lot to uh, Emily uh, for being on here. Uh, they're part of Peace Action. We have 100 chapters and affiliate. Um, and Emily and Desiree and others, I think, are on the, on the call who worked there, did some amazing work over the last couple of years in our Peace Voter campaign with elections. Uh, Joseph, it's always great to be on here with, with you. Um, you deserve all the awards that you've got, and it's great to meet you, Don Asia. So I really like to think about U.S. foreign policy and militarism like a huge oil tanker that moves forward, belching out um, clouds of smoke, leaking oil, running over small boats in its wake. Um, and that's, you know, over the years, it's sometimes it's a little bit cleaner, sometimes it uh, it runs a little slower. It's typically heading for a big iceberg, which could be a world war or a nuclear war. Um, sometimes, you know, sometimes a little bit better, sometimes a little worse. Uh, when Trump took the helm, it was like some a captain who had zero experience, wild, crazy, unpredictable, um, started stealing pieces of the ship, put the ship on full forward ahead towards that iceberg. Uh, engines running full blast, running over boats, replaced the crew with incompetent thieves and pirates, uh, uh, and started dismantling the ship, taking off the safety features. And now <laughs> we're moving to a Biden administration. And with him at the helm, at least he has some experience captaining, captaining a ship. Uh, we'll likely put more ethical and skilled crew that are gonna have to spend a lot of time uh, replacing parts, and perhaps when they replace the parts, they'll replace them with better, cleaner parts. Um, maybe safer materials, maybe the ship is going to run cleaner, maybe it's going to be more predictable in its course, maybe that course is going to slowly veer away from the iceberg, uh, but unfortunately the ship is not going to turn into um, a green uh, sailboat. Um, but it's, you know, it's moving forward, it'll move forward and hopefully it'll be a certainly better, uh, better ship than we saw the last four years. So I'm gonna talk a bit about uh, Biden, personnel choices and policy, a little bit about the US Congress and maybe some things to think about in the future. I think uh, we all need to consider that we don't know the Senate outcome as was mentioned earlier. We have the two runoffs in Georgia, uh, one of those 
uh, candidates, Rev Reverend Warnock, Peace Action has endorsed and we uh, uh, helped raise money, put a, an organizer to help him get to the runoff and we will likely do that again um, to help hopefully him win. Uh, we need those two senators because it'll make things much more difficult if the Democrats don't have control of the Senate for Biden to move certain things forward. Now, while peace action, we're completely nonpartisan, we have actually endorsed a couple of Republicans uh, back in the day, but typically a Republican is gonna score between you know, zero and 10 on our voting record, and uh, Re Democrats score typically 75 to 100 on our voting record. So we are typically supporting um, uh, Democrats. So taking a look at the Biden administration, the first thing um, as mentioned by Joseph is personnel. Uh, personnel is policies like one like to hear. You know, there are a few thousand appointed persons um, that the administration will move forward with. Uh, over a thousand of them will actually need to be confirmed by the Senate. That means the Senate will need to vote on them. They'll need 51 votes um, to get through the Senate and maybe even more votes depending on how the cloture situation is. Uh, they will probably typically not use uh, the cloture rule which requires 60 senators, so it'll probably just need to be 51. Um, so that means if the Democrats don't win, you're gonna need Republican support to get uh, members of the cabinet uh, confirmed. Uh, so expecting huge progressive folks to be uh, nominated is just not likely because they're just not going to be, they're not going to get confirmed. Now, there are some ways that Biden can go around uh, the Senate, recess appointments, et cetera, without getting, going into the weeds of, of that procedures. Um, we'll have to see if, if he's willing to do that, because if he starts doing that a lot, then the next Republican administration will do that. Um, so there's kind of this balancing act, and so we'll have to see. I expect that a lot of um, those who are appointed, we're going to certainly see more diversity, uh, hopefully those with more ethics, uh, hopefully less scandals, less indictments. Remember, there are many members of the Trump administration under indictment, and I'm sure there'll be more. Um, there was already a list of 500 advisors that was released yesterday. On those, you can see it's, it's, it is fairly diverse. Uh, there are some good names on there. Uh, you know, again, probably not any huge uh, progressive stalwarts, but uh, maybe some. Uh, but the, most of these people are going to be coming with experience. They have real experience on working on the issues. Um, you know that under the Trump administration, people were thrown in who had zero experience uh, either working with government. Um, so that will be a big change. And I, along with other colleagues, have been pushing um, diverse uh, progressives already uh, to attempt to get them into the administration. Uh, then you have to look at the whole other civil service. There are uh, some 2 million people who work in government, one over a million active duty military, another million uh, on reserve, and 4 million contractors who work for the U.S. government. Um, some of those, some of those have been working with their head down and having probably some resistance on the inside, um, they'll be more free to do their work, these career silver, civil servants. Um, so that will be um, helpful. And then for those, those of us who work on the outside, we, were, we will probably get invited back to the White House. We met at the White House under the Obama administration, we were able to push them and have these relationships we were able to push. Um, so I won't talk about Flournoy, which um, Joseph did. You know, there are going to be these bad choices, and we're going to do our best to get questions asked. And some people are going to try to probably block some of these appointments. Um, I think it'll be challenging, but that's stuff we're going to work on. Uh, the next thing is the budget. Uh, the president does provide a budget. It's typically not one that is completely followed, but it gives a good indication on where a president might veto and for um, uh, a tone for the party. Uh, and the interesting thing is right now, there's this, very, there's this great opportunity is typically when a new president comes in, they need to put a budget in by the beginning of February. So they're not even working and they need to put together a whole budget for the government for 2022, sometime by the beginning of February. It usually runs a little bit later, uh, but it is an opportunity to attempt to get good things um, in the budget before 
um, all these appointments. Because when you have the people appointed, then they're all fighting for their piece of the pie and pushing the budget. So there's this kind of small window that some of us are working on to try to influence uh, the budget, specifically the Pentagon budget. Under the under Clinton, when Clinton first came in, there was a slight dip, and that was because of this um, first budget they put together. So people will be working on that now. Um, so funding for Department of State, USAID, uh, other places, we hopefully to see uh, better budgets there. Uh, on policy, uh, the big thing will be executive orders. Uh, we know that the Biden transition team has already have a long list of executive orders that they're going to do to rescind things that the Trump administration has done and probably new executive orders. Some will be around uh, the Iran nuclear agreement that Joseph mentioned uh, to start moving that back in place. Biden has said he's willing to do that. He'll have to talk to Iran and move that forward. There may be some hiccups, but that will happen. Uh, the, the START treaty, which is uh, set to expire, that the Trump administration is supposedly negotiating maybe a, a year-long extension, uh, we know Biden will move forward with the START treaty. We will likely see no other treaties because treaties will take, um, you know, over 60, over two-thirds of the Senate to vote, and it's hard to see that happening um, during this current Senate. We might see um, a stop in building some of the new nuclear weapons. Joseph mentioned that uh, Biden is so supportive, no first use, and will be moving forward with the nuclear posture review. Joseph also mentioned about uh, Yemen and Saudi Arabia, and Trump had actually vetoed um, a blockage of arms sales to Saudi Arabia, and we expect that uh, Biden would not veto that. Um, there's bad things. We know that Biden is still pro-NATO. We know there's a big, been a big shift in uh, uh, even a Democratic Party about the U.S.-China relationship and this new Cold War that's happening between us and China. We expect that's probably going to continue um, and something that we'll need to push back. Um, and we will hope to see more transparency from the Biden administration. There was a lot of reports that didn't happen, uh, access to information that was blocked, uh, but we'll see better transparency, which should help members of Congress to work. So speaking of Congress, um, uh, you know, the, the House will at least be able to work with the administration closer rather than reacting to a bad administration. There's gonna be a change of chairs, uh, most likely on the Senate, even if Republicans hold, Republican chairs are gonna switch. Um, if the Senate, if the Democrats get the Senate, then there's gonna be a bunch of new chairs of Senate committees, including some of our allies. On the House, we're also gonna see uh, chair uh, shift. Uh, we are already working uh, spe specifically on the House Foreign Affairs Committee in which there's a run and there's at least one good progressive representative Castro who's running for that, that folks are gonna try to help get him elected um, to that chair. But there's other chairs as well. Uh, memberships of committees are gonna change. We may see some more uh, progressives in the House Armed Services Committee, which will be helpful. The Congressional Progressive Caucus will likely uh, now gain a percentage of, um, of Democrats in the House, so they might be able to have more influence. Uh, and already we're working with colleagues um, in Congress on strategies around sanctions. We may see certainly more push from Congress around san sanctions. There's a, a movement of the narrative, even with Democrats now saying sanctions don't work, we need to figure out something different from sanctions, and hopefully that will spill over into the administration. Uh, same thing uh, with North Korea, uh, and maybe there'll be some movement on the authorization of use of military force. Uh, I was already mentioned there's an internal fight going on with the Democrats around moderates and progressives, uh, but it is clear that there was a lot of things that were passed that were progressive um, throughout the country. Uh, uh, minimum wage in Florida, uh, cannabis laws passed around, so this fight it, I think is, is not helpful in the party. Um, looking to the future, we have a lame duck. Uh, Congress is going to have to pass something to move to move uh, funding for the government. Uh, we will be pushing to make sure whatever it passes doesn't include more Pentagon spending, but it'll be a difficult fight as that will be coming up within the next couple of weeks. Uh, and there's not good good signs as far as next elections. The Republicans won most of the state houses, which means they will be involved in redistricting and gerrymandering districts, uh, which make it more favorable more favorable for them. Um, and also they will likely continue to do voter suppression as they will now will control state laws. Uh, so that doesn't look good uh, for Democrats. We're already looking ahead, uh, election 2022, uh, where there will be a chance to take the Senate back for the Democrats if 
um, if they don't already, and uh, thinking about, uh, unfortunately, the presidential election in 2024, in which some people saying Trump may run again, uh, all help us, um, or Pompeo may run, or others. Um, so those are some things to think about. I really appreciate you letting me speak today. Thank you enormously, Paul. That was most instructive for most of us who live in other parts of uh, in other parts of the world. Um, uh, I see that some people have raised their little applause, yellow hands. The applause comes comes from all of us. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, now we have a fair amount of time. We have over half an hour, I would say, for questions and answers. Um, at the very beginning, Eskil told you how you can raise your hand. I'm sure you all know we've been we've been using Zoom these now for months, uh, at least we in Europe with our lockdowns. So um, you can do it by going to the bottom of your screen and clicking on participants. I'm looking at mine, which is probably a bit different from yours because mine's in Italian. And then uh, as you go to your find yourself and then amongst the options, you will find that there is the option raise hand. And you can do that. Or you can be sort of nice old fashioned and non-digital and just wave at me like this. Is that you, Reiner? Are you waving at me? Do you want to speak? Go ahead, Reiner. First of all, thank you all for these highly interesting introductions. I have one question, one comment. I think the question is that the governments in Europe have a lot of hope for revitalizing the relations to the United States, not similar, but quite equal they were under Obama. Knowing and they are definitely willing to this. So my question is, will there be cuts in the military budget of the United States? Is this one point which is in the discussion in the new Obama administration? And my second point, I think, to say it in easy word, imperialistic system is imperialistic system independently who is president. This creates the need for more cooperation of both sides of the Atlantic. I remember the time when Obama becomes president and the social movement in the United States decreased immediately and there was really a silence in the social movements. What do you think is now the reactions? When I understood Emily correct, I think there is a huge is a chance of revitalizing the social movements because they are not so illusions, not such an illusion than in the beginning of the Obama administration. So the second, my second question is, what do you think? Are there chances to revitalize the social movement and in addition for new corporations on the minimum both sides of the Atlantic, but above all more international? Um, I'm wondering, I can't seem to see any other hands. Oh, yes, I can now. Bahram, I see them in this order. I don't know whether this was the order they were raised in. First Bahram, then David Watson, then Andre Hunko. Is that okay? Bahram. Yes. Uh, yes, it's Bahram. Bahram. Yes, thank you very much for uh, having me. Uh, allowing me to speak here. Yeah, um, I'm with the Green Party US and we have our, had our own candidate, Howie Hawkins, because we don't go along with the new liberal candidates of the Democratic Party, especially someone like Biden, that is the right wing of the Democratic Party. And uh, as you know, he has approved all the wars. He has been fifth, about 50 years in the Senate. He is a very experienced politician. He has approved all the wars that the U.S. has had. But uh, just wanted to say a few words on how Biden was elected, was, I mean, became the candidate. Uh, if you be, remember the primaries, uh, he was very poor showing and Bernie Sanders was ahead of him. But uh, it came, and also Kamala Harris ha had to withdraw. She was also a candidate, but she, 
she had so poor showing that she had to withdraw. But then the party bosses, including Obama, went to them and said, okay, no, you cannot have Sanders and you need to have uh, Biden. So this is how it worked. Uh, same way it worked during FDR, after FDR. FDR had a running mate named uh, Wallace who had uh, uh, is more progressive than uh, Sanders. He had New Deal too, which included universal health care, also included um, uh, job guarantee. But at the last moment in the convention, the party bosses came at, with, and said, no, he can't be a candidate. He, they brought in Truman, who was a conservative character. So my point here is that then nobody here talked about the deep state, which has been running uh, the country for so long. The deep state uh, includes the military industrial financial complex. These are the people basically who run the country and then never ending wars and you see the effects. But so I'm so surprised that people keep talking about, and um, Trump was an anomaly. He is not your typical uh, Republican, but the analysis is always uh, talking about him like he's this typical Republican, fascist, racist. Well, his uh, vice uh, president is Pence, but well, nobody mentions that Trump had some peace gestures. He went and talked to North Korea, despite the disagreements of his own party, Democratic Party, none of these two parties want peace with North Korea. But Trump went and talked to them. And he said he was going to meet with leaders of Iran and Venezuela. So you need to uh, look at the whole picture, not just this propaganda that is, see the propaganda machine is also in the hands of the deep state. I mean, things like CNN, New York Times, they just work for the deep state. So they obviously pushed for, for Biden. So- um, Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I, I have next on my list uh, people who have raised their hands, David Watson, Andre Hunko, and Pat Elder. I suggest that I give the floor now to David Watson, and that'll be the first three questions. Then we have a round of answers, and then I get back to Andre and Pat Elder. Uh, so, David, now. Yeah, uh, good evening, and thank you for the invitation to the to tonight's meeting. I am uh, working with the Norwegian Committee in Solidarity with Latin America, but I also, I'm also involved with the Norwegian Anti-War Initiative. Um, I, I was uh, listening to the speakers who were talking about foreign policy. And one of the areas where the USA is, is most in, involved uh, or has a, a major interventionist policy is uh, the subcontinent of Latin America, USA's backyard, uh, mostly in recent times, Venezuela and Cuba, but also any other country which doesn't follow the, the neoliberal consensus and, uh, and threatens the USA's economic and resource and geopolitical interests in the subcontinent. Uh, Paul brushed on Latin America a little and talked about the immigration problem as, uh, as, uh, um, as uh, an issue where there might be changes with the Biden government. Um, no, that was Joseph, sorry. And uh, Paul mentioned that there may be changes in uh, sanctions policy uh, with the Biden government. But an alternative to sanctions doesn't mean that there will be a, 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 foreign, a, a different foreign policy without intervention. It means that they'll find more subtle, probably more subtle ways of, uh, of regime change. And Biden's record in the, with the Obama government and the, the coups in, in, uh, in Honduras and uh, uh, are not very promising, but I, I wonder if the speakers could uh, maybe elaborate a bit more on how they think the a Biden administration would uh, function differently in in their foreign policy towards Latin America. 
Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you very much for those for that question. We now have, I, I would suggest now that I give a chance to our speakers to respond to these first three series of questions. It wasn't just questions. I know that Emily would like to answer Reiner on building up movements. Emily, would you want to start? Sure. Thanks. Um, yeah, I think that what Biden was talking about, or <laughs> what Reiner was talking about uh, with you know, our movements existing and being there regardless of presidents is exactly what I was kind of trying to speak to uh, in my comments. And I think that there are obviously many bad things about this pandemic and many people being in lockdown. But I think one of the positives is that we've all become a little bit more tech savvy, right? So I've been part of um, helping plan online world conferences um, from a youth perspective, continuing to work with the International Peace Bureau Youth Network um, to plan various webinars. So I think that this moment where we're all online means that none of our events have borders. I guess our only, time, our only restriction is really that we are in different time zones. Um, so we still need to find a time that works that hopefully folks don't have to wake up at 2 a.m. to join. Um, but I think that we are in a moment where we can really continue to strengthen and build this international cooperation across the Atlantic, even further more globally. Um, and I think that um, under this administration, not having all the time and breathing room in the world, but having a little bit less of that uh, sheer panic on some issues um, means that we have more space to grow and build that. Um, so I hope that kind of speaks to Reiner's question. Um, and also just to quickly speak to um, what was mentioned about like Trump and his policies on peace. Um, I know Peace Action New York State and Peace Action more broadly is part of the Korea Peace Now Network. And we were in favor of, of opening talks with North Korea. That was one of the very few things I think we could ever possibly praise Trump for. Um, and obviously he didn't have a ton of follow through. We still don't have, you know, um, a formal peace declaration, like the Korean War has never been formally ended. Um, we don't have as much of an improvement in the pathways to diplomacy as we were hoping for. But just to say that I don't think any of us have ever just unquestionably followed or endorsed any presidential candidate or congressional candidate or Senate candidate. And I think that, um, you know, whoever is in office, we're going to be critical of what they're doing. And we're going to say when we support something that they do and make it really clear when we don't. Um, so just to clarify, we were not against Trump's meeting with uh, North Korea. We're actually very in favor of that. Thank you, Emily. That was very good. Thank you. Um, may I suggest that Paul might want to answer Reiner's big chunk of question on military spending? Would you, Paul? Is that okay oh, by you? Yeah, thanks for the question, Reiner. Um, well, people know who's worked with me here in DC that I'm a pretty big realist. Um, so I certainly want to provide hope, but I've just seen how DC works over the last 20 years. Um, so I do think there's an opportunity uh, for the minimum to slow the growth under the Trump administration that has grown, uh, grew, did grow under the Biden administration as well. Um, so I mean, I think there is an opportunity to slow the growth and maybe an opportunity to flat and, and, and reduce it. Uh, but this is a very short window. Once, once, every, once the Biden administration gets in uh, and everyone's appointed, I think it becomes more difficult. Uh, but we can also change what the money is being spent on, which may be more important, such as new nuclear weapons, which are moving forward under the Trump, Trump administration. Uh, so maybe you see more money is being spent, let's say, on safety for troops, uh, troop, troop pay, uh, troop benefits. I mean, there's a huge problem with troops who live under the poverty line, need to, need to get uh, special housing, on food stamps, not getting you know, proper care. So maybe the money is moved to different items, but it, it's a challenge. Reducing the Pentagon budget is a challenge here in the US. Uh, there are more groups who are signing on to it. There are uh, Greenpeace and Friends of the Earth who are taking more action to see the connection with uh, the Pentagon being like the 42nd country, if it was a country, as far as climate 
polluter, 300 barrels, 300,000 barrels of oil a day. So, you know, there's an opportunity. Uh, I'm cautious, cautiously optimistic and it will push forward, but it's a short, I feel like it's a short window. I mean, we'll have to see how it moves forward um, for the um, Pentagon spending. Uh, around the Green Party, uh, Peace Action has actually endorsed Green Party uh, people in the past. Uh, we do live in a two-party system here. I can choose between 100 different types of toilet paper, but I only have two parties to choose from. Uh, it is unfortunate. I'm not sure I want 100 parties like in Italy, but uh, it's something that needs to be changed. It's peace action can only work on so much, so we don't really work on, on that. Uh, but we're glad to see that there's more ranked choice voting, uh, which also helps kind of put some of, um, some of the two-party system into, um, into check. Uh, and I agree with what David said, the Muslim ban is one item, immigration is one item, and sanctions I do see as a possible, I mean, there'll definitely be a change from what the Trump administration is doing. Uh, the Trump administration plans right now is, is, has put the most sanctions as possible on Iran, and they're gonna do new sanctions, they say, once every week until uh, the inauguration. So some of these sanctions are definitely gonna be moving back, um, and the way sanctions have, um, stopped a lot of humanitarian organizations from uh, going, uh, going to countries. So we work a lot with American Friends Service Committee who has the longest program in North Korea. Uh, they were to try to get some of their visas. It was taking them years. They got sued by the Trump administration. So we expect some of that stuff to change. And we're just also seeing a good change in the Democratic Party on this issue. More Democrats are willing to speak out, sign letters, uh, talk about how sanctions just aren't working. Um, so I do expect to see some change. Again, I don't see the big, the big green sailboat. I see a change in this, uh, in this, in, in unfortunately this oil tanker. Hopefully, getting cleaner uh, and getting better. Uh, but you know, for anyone to expect major, major changes in some on some of the foreign policy issues uh, compared to maybe Obama, I, I think it's a little bit too hopeful. But we will see changes. Thank you, Paul. Donasia, do you, do you want to intervene on the social movements part of the question, or any part of any of the questions you heard? I would yeah. be very happy. Cool, well, thank you for these questions. Um, I think in terms of revitalizing social movements, um, I, the Black Lives Matter movement is definitely completely embodied. Um, we've been out in the streets. Um, and even, like I said on Saturday, when I went out of my uh, house after the, the announcement came down, there was already a protest happening. And we were saying at that protest, this is our first protest of President Biden. Um, and so I think it's important to be clear, um, BLM is nonpartisan. Um, and I think it's important to show that we are based in reality and we do understand that neither of these parties is a savior for anybody. Neither of these parties, again, is really for the people. Um, and as was stated, that there are, uh, you know, global financial interests that, that, you know, excuse the trade, but Trump, anything that we the people have to say um, in terms of our politicians and our government. And so it is up to us to, to keep our foot to their, their foot to the fire and keep our feet on the gas um, in terms of not only voting, but in protests and in, in, in all the ways that we can, we can fight against the, the systems Thank that are oppressing us. Um, and yeah. Thank you very much, Donesia. Joseph, uh, um, who would you like to reply to, or all of them? <laughs> just, just, a, just a couple of points. Yeah. Um, first, just, you know, one thing that's telling about Biden is that um, in, in his major acceptance speech um, in, in Wilmington, and then his, his more recent uh, you know, public speech, he closed both speeches by saying, God bless the troops. Uh, God bless our troops, uh, you know, and that I think reflects, you know, the kind of the continuity uh, of, of, of U.S. militarism and of, of, of the system. Um, speaking to speaking to uh, Bazam, uh, just to say, you know, it's, I think it's beyond the um, what's called the deep state. I mean, we need to understand that the United States has been essentially an imperial nation for more than 125 years, right? Uh, and so it's a deep part of the culture. Um, uh, it's not just at the military or the economic level, you look at cultural race, all the rest, it's an integrated system. Uh, and so the challenge to us is really to be working to transform that, that system. You can't just do one 
one part and, and, and not the others. And I will say that in this past election with people like Noam Chomsky and others, my sense was that what was most deeply at, at stake was some, con some continuation of something like uh, a constitutional uh, a democracy, uh, that Trump basically seeks to become a fascist dictator. Uh, and so in, in that circumstance, uh, it's very important to, to be in, in a um, uh, united front to preserve some semblance of constitutional democracy so we have the space to continue struggling in the next four years. Uh, a number of us were saying, fine, the day after the election, the day after Biden wins, then we go out in the street trying to, 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 to impact and turn, uh, turn Biden. So, you know, some, some differences among us. Uh, I guess the um, two last things to say quickly, um, the, the discussion around social movements uh, reminded me that, that uh, Reiner had earlier challenged me uh, to begin working on a, on a statement of, of US uh, European uh, peace movement solidarity and, 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 and continuity, uh, not continuity, but revitalization. Uh, so that's, that's something on, on our to-do list to, to be working on. And the last thing, which I, I forgot to, to say, you know, I, I, I tend to work at, at several levels, you know, both the um, uh, maybe, maybe utopian in terms of, 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 of wanting it all, and at the same time needing to recognize, as Paul was saying, you know, the reality of the world that I, I live in. And the dangers of a U.S.-Chinese war uh, growing out of an incident in the South China Sea, the East China Sea, uh, or over Taiwan, a war that would uh, inevitably uh, expand possibly to, to, to nuclear conflict, or the dangers of war between US, uh, US and NATO on the one side and Russia uh, growing out of the very provocative military exercises, say in the, in the Baltic uh, Sea region or the Black Sea region, tells us that it's absolutely imperative for us to be preventing war. And in that context with folks in, in IPB, uh, we've been working trying to bring forward the concept of common security, the, the concept that was uh, the, the foundation, the paradigm uh, for ending the Cold War. So I'll just kind of put that out here as, as one of the things that we need to be pushing on in this period when we have a little bit of space. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you very much. Now, I have five more people who have asked uh, to, to, who want to ask questions. So they're going to have to be pretty short uh, because I'm, we're supposed to close at 7.30, I'm told. Um, so the list, uh, uh, let me tell you who the people are. Andre, Pat Elder, Christine, Tara Curry, and then Sean. Okay, and then four, our four speakers get a, chance, get a chance to answer. And I think that's going to take at least 15 minutes but only if all of you are fairly disciplined, otherwise it could take four hours. Andre, to you. Thank you very much um, for this very interesting meeting. Um, I'm uh, a member of the German parliament of, for the Linke and member of the OSCE parliamentary assembly. And I was um, election, observer, uh, election observer in the US uh, during this election for the OSCE. Oh, wow. And I have one message and uh, two questions. Uh, first, the message, um, the report of the OSCE will be very cr critical on the electoral system. Mm. Um, and one issue is, for example, that we were only allowed uh, regularly in one third of the states to observe the election. Me, I personally wanted to go to North Carolina. This was possible for the OSCE to, to do it um, in the last election. Uh, this was uh, one week before the election. It was uh, the OSCE was thrown out, uh, and so I went to Missouri, St. Louis. Uh, and there will be a lot of, um, uh, I think, important remarks in, in the report of the OSCE, which is uh, that uh, 5.2 million uh, people are not allowed to vote because they they are in prison or have been in prison, uh, or the. Um, <clears throat> Very a uh, lot of lot of issue. You know all the issues, I think. But I I would like to encourage you, um, um, uh, the American U.S. American friends, uh, to make use of uh, the report because the U.S. has has uh, um, uh, committed itself uh, to uh, to follow the uh, OSCE recommendations, and uh, they are committed to invite. Um, 
uh, us all over the country. Um, and then I have two questions. One on Latin America, I very much agree which all was said. I don't have very much hope on, on the foreign politics of Biden. I think it's good that um, as it seems, I know it's not over, but as it seems that uh, Trump uh, is uh, probably is, uh, will um, uh, in the end, he will leave uh, the White House. Um, uh, uh, but um, most of my comrades here as well, they don't have very much hope on the foreign politics, but there are some um, elements, maybe um, there could be a difference. First is on Latin America, is what David Watson as well um, uh, mentioned. Uh, um, mm -hmm. There are some developments in the last weeks, uh, um, which uh, gives me a bit hope. Uh, the elections in Bolivia, the referendum in Chile, and we have uh, will have now new uh, developments like the elections, uh, parliamentary elections in Venezuela on 6th of December or the elections in Ecuador. So what do you think um, uh, concerning, for example, Venezuela? Do you think um, uh, um, Biden will go on that very extreme sanction course of, uh, of Trump? Uh, they, they have a problem because Guaido anyway will, um, uh, they cannot keep uh, this politics of recognizing Guaido. So do you think that there could be a, um, a difference in the um, foreign policy um, there. And second, uh, last question uh, on uh, Russia. Uh, there were some um, cautious hopes from some Russian foreign politic, pol pol politicians uh, that there could be at least some agreements reinstalled, like the Iran agreement or maybe the um, that, that we can keep the START um, uh, treaties do you think there um, there could be uh, this um, yeah, that we could um, at least uh, keep these uh, these issues? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andre. I am so looking forward to reading the OSCE report. Very much looking forward to that. My next uh, person on asking question is Pat Elder. Well, thank you. You all hear me okay? Yeah. Great. Well, let me make a comment and then just see how people want to uh, respond. I, I think we're in a great period of crisis. I mean, this is a tumultuous time akin to, you know, Russians marching into Berlin. And I think we may be in the midst of a coup. Um, and I, I, I think we can look first with um, Trump, uh, you know, taking his yes men and placing them into leadership roles in the DOD and the FBI and the CIA. And, um, you know, I, I don't think Trump will leave voluntarily. And um, I think, you know, if we look at the history of coups in the 20th century, uh, you know, generally it's, it's the folks with the most guns and the most discipline. And so I think January 20th is gonna be an interesting day. Um, and um, I, I think there's a good chance that January 20th will come and go and Trump will still be in office. Pat, that's very gloomy outlook. Thank you, though. Thank you very much. Uh, Christine. Christine? I don't see her anymore. Christine? There she is. Yeah, hello. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I just want to underline that Trump has no positive uh, point. He is a uh, anti-feminist, he is a racist, and he has no respect neither for humans nor for the environment. And he is killing people and killing more people than uh, other presidents. He increases and uh, implements new sanctions, and sanctions is war, and sanctions are killing people. Look to Cuba, look to Venezuela, look to um, the Iran and also uh, to other uh, countries. And uh, Trump increases the uh, um, drone war and he hasn't ended the war in Afghanistan, what he has promised, he is lying. And also North Korea was not a real agreement and it was not uh, on the same level the discussions they had. 
therefore there is nothing which could be a good and a positive point of uh, view to the person of Trump. And <laughs> yeah, I think- um, Thank you. We have to take care that he will never come back or also some of his best friends. Thank you very much, Christine. I heartily agree. Tara, Tara Curry. Hi, I'm Tara Curry with Peace Action New York State and Brooklyn for Peace. And I wanted to ask about from an organizer's point of view, there's a very strong Black Lives Matter movement. We have a speaker here this afternoon. Um, but when we're speaking now, we're speaking mainly about foreign policy and how that uh, affects the uh, Black American community. Um, it, it's not really a point of the discussion today. And on the other hand, um, when I, I look at domestic movements, um, they tend not to talk about foreign policy anymore because the black community is under assault in the United States and foreign policy is so far away um, from you know, the problems we have in the schools now with COVID, from um, the pollution we have, uh, from all those things. And, but that connection and that uniting of those two movements um, isn't it's certainly not happening in the streets and um, if, if some of the speakers might um, comment on that and on, on what we can do to tie in domestic movements more as well as encouraging the, uh, domestic movements to think more about foreign policy. Thank you Tara, that was a very interesting question. Sean, I have one last question which Sean wants to ask specifically to Donasia. Sean? Yes, uh, so my question is for Don Asia, um, and it's uh, related to the last question here a little bit. So the Black Lives Matter movement has become a global movement for, just, for racial justice. Um, we've seen protests all around the world, including here in Berlin. Um, and while every part of this movement has their national and their local goals, um, I'm also curious as to what uh, the successes of the Black community in the US could mean for the Black Lives Matter movements in countries around the world, um, and also as an international movement, if this is pushing the movement forward in some way. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. That was quick and easy. Now, um, we have time for each of our four speakers to reply, but we don't have infinite time. I'm supposed to close this within six minutes, but I think we can take 10 easily. So off you go, two to two and a half minutes each, starting with Joseph, the same order as you spoke, I think is the best. Joseph. Okay, well, I wanna begin by responding to, to Pat because I'm largely in agreement with him. It's not, it, it, as I began my talk, uh, it's, not a, it's, it's not a done deal in terms of Biden taking office and not only between now and January, but if Biden takes office, I think the struggle is still going to be to preserve something like constitutional democracy and expand it. It's not, you know, given the 70 million vote uh, the money and the structures that uh, the extreme right has in this country, I think that has to remain an absolutely major priority. Uh, in terms of Venezuela, uh, my sense is that uh, the Trump Trump policy and coup there uh, failed, uh, and that uh, while 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 Biden is certainly not going to uh, end what's been uh, imperial policy toward Latin America, uh, I, I think he'll he'll have to be making some kind of accommodation uh, to it. Which is not to say we don't remember that, that uh, you know, the Obama administration and, and Clinton have played the major role in, in the overthrow in, in, in Honduras. Um, uh, yeah, just the other piece, just to say kind of responding to, um, uh, to Christine is just to appreciate how fundamentally evil uh, the Trump administration has, has been. When we're talking about the number of people killed all around the world, I think we also have to remember that we're now at a quarter of a million of US people who have died from COVID-19, largely because of his policies and his, his, his refusal to take responsibility. Uh, you know, at so many levels, this, this man is, is fundamentally uh, evil. And then just real quickly, just to say that I do expect the efforts will be made um, in response to Andrej uh, to, to renew both the Iran deal uh, and the uh, and, and New START. 
Um, the start would be a whole lot easier, I think. Thank you, Joseph. Emily? Great, thanks. Um, yeah, just to say that I think that we can't fully rule out the possibility of an attempted coup. Obviously, that's what the groundwork is being laid for right now. Um, I know we are part of the Protect the Results Coalition in New York City. Um, there's also efforts across the state that our community chapters are involved in. Peace Action is also nationally involved in this coalition. Um, so there is like a mass movement of people who have already mobilized against some of Trump's comments, but are ready to continue to plan and mobilize um, should he continue to push this rhetoric, which I imagine he will. Um, I'll also say that I agree. I don't think Trump has any good points to clarify my points on Korea. I think that peace on the Korean Peninsula is about the people on the Korean Peninsula. And if that means that um, Trump agreeing to meet with um, North Korea's leader is slightly less of a chance of some sort of nuclear war breaking out, then that's a good thing for the people. Um, and something that, you know, I don't think Trump should be praised for as like a brilliant idea, but just to say that um, a broken clock is still right about twice a day. Um, and I would, I'm obviously not endorsing really anything else he's done. And I give the credit to any progress that's been made to the grassroots movements um, on both parts of the Korean Peninsula and to the Korean diaspora um, here in the US. Um, also, I, I will obviously let Danesia speak a little bit more to the Black Lives Matter question and connecting movements, but just to say that I think that we as a peace movement need to examine our role um, in upholding white supremacy in why our movement is still this white this many years later. Um, and I think that it's not just a question of asking um, people who work on racial justice why they're not connecting it to um, our peace issues, but why we are not showing up for them in the same way as well. Um, so I think uh, that bridge really needs to be built on both sides and we really need to examine um, our role in continuing to build that. Because if we really are for peace and disarmament, we have to be for it everywhere. Um, not just preventing wars abroad, but also preventing the extreme violence against black and indigenous people in the United States um, and, and everywhere really. So yeah, those, those are- Thank you, points. Emily. Oh, the great words, I very much agree. Donasia, up to you. Oh, yes. Um, I think the, for uh, Pat's point, absolutely. Uh, we are definitely concerned about a coup. I think we should definitely be taking it very seriously um, that that Trump is not going to go down without a fight. Uh, he's continuing to fight right now um, and we need to be prepared. And, and we are, again, locally organizing and even in our protests, upping our, our levels of security and our levels of not only de-escalation, but, um, but escalation as well um, in preparation for for the increased violence that we've seen in protests as well. Uh, I think in terms of the foreign policy effect on Black Americans, Black people have always understood the United States as an imperial nation. Um, so that is very basic. Uh, I don't know a Black person who, who doesn't understand the, the, the violence that the US perpetuates throughout the world. Um, and we absolutely do lift up uh, international movements in the streets um, and in our, in our um, statements and in our policy making. Um, in, I personally went to Brazil in 2016. We've had several um, delegations to Brazil, to Palestine, Cuba. Um, uh, you know, Asada Shakur, we lift her up constantly and she is in exile in Cuba. And so I think that those, those um, connections are very apparent to us. Um, and we consistently do try to lift that. On the blacklivesmatter.com website right now, you can see the Pre-21 Savage campaign um, which was a, a, around ICE um, and deportation. Opal Tometi, one of the co-founders of Black Lives Matter, was the executive director of the Black Alliance for Just Immigration um, as, as she was co-founding the, the network. And so that has always been a part of our work, um, whether or not that is lifted in the mainstream. Of course, we know that the media will, you know, tie into what they want. Um, and so our movement has kind of, in some ways, been pigeonholed into a uh, solely a, a, um, a national mass incarceration uh, movement and, and police brutality movement, but we understand um, that we are connected internationally um, and that that is a, a strength. It's only a strength that we be connected. Um, and as Emily was saying earlier, one of the benefits of this, um, this current predicament that we find ourselves in globally is that 
being online more, we actually are able to connect even more so with our, our, our comrades across the world. Um, but yeah, going back to even, you know, Muhammad Ali, um, I think that, that black leaders um, and black folks in general have, have seen that international connection. Um, myself particularly, I'm interested in learning more about um, the, these international relations and I've learned so much on this panel. I am starting um, school at Harvard in January. Um, and so I'm looking to do more international relations work um, and that can be supported um, through Pay a Black Woman. You can find that online. Um, and so I'm super excited to, to dig more into it, but I do think that is definitely a part of our movements. Gomesia, we will be in touch. We will be in touch over the next few months and you can help us help us uh, dig this, dig into this more deeply. Uh, Paul, you are our last member of the panel. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Andre, for coming to our country and help us out for, with democracy. Uh, and, you know, as, as was mentioned earlier, um, there are things that we agreed with, with Trump. We agreed with him about, you know, the role of NATO, uh, talking, uh, having diplomacy with others, um, ending endless wars. Uh, there were things that we agreed. And I also agree with him that, you know, we have problems with our election system, but it's just not the same problems that he talks about. Uh, the problems that we have is there, you know, that we still allow in some states for people to carry guns and come very close to polls, which reminds uh, people of color back in the day when they weren't able to come or they were threatened to, they were threatened when they went to vote. We still have that here. Uh, we still have ID laws that you know, make it hard for people to vote. Uh, it's difficult for people to registration. There's purging of voter rolls. Uh, the Republicans are really known for dirty tricks. When you really look at some of the frauds, it's typically from Republicans. Uh, they do calls and robocalls, uh, telling people the wrong voting date, the wrong voting time. I mean, we, we do have a lot to do here. We don't have it as a day off, which most countries do, and it's not compulsory. It should just be mail-in. We should have more than one day. I mean, there's so much we can do to empower more people to vote, and we have a lot to learn. So thanks, thanks, Andre. Um, oh, and you, you mentioned Venezuela. I don't think that, um, I do think that the Biden administration will likely uh, lessen sanctions on Venezuela, is my guess. Um, and Russia, I do think that we might see some agreements, but it'll be difficult to have, we won't have treaties. So there may be some agreements around nuclear weapons. Uh, Pat, Pat Elder is a longtime friend of Peace Action, done great work in Maryland, doing some really good stuff right now around pollution issues in Maryland. Um, I, I think we all need to be vigilant and watch. Um, we hear that uh, Trump is, his mood is back and forth from actually wanting to, to say something to fighting. Um, we hear that senators are privately congratulating Biden, but don't want to do it publicly because they don't want uh, Trump's uh, Twitter wrath. Uh, we under it's probably Pompeo is saying what he's saying because he may want to run for president. So he would he wants Trump on his side if he runs for, for president. I mean, in the day, it's very difficult for me to see that the Secret Service won't export him out, that the Secret Service is going to flip to Trump's side. Nonetheless, as um, as Emily said, we are part of Protect the Results. We are on the calls. We are monitoring and ready to do whatever peace action can if something like that happens. Um, and Tara, you have good questions. Uh, we are working still on ending the 1033 program with the Pentagon, which is providing uh, weapons grade materials to, uh, to police departments. Uh, we think that that might be ended under the Biden administration. We shall see. We're well aware of the poverty draft that happens within the military. We know that wars typically are inherently racist. Uh, we typically only bomb people of color, it seems like. Um, and the sanctions issue is also mostly affecting people of color. And so it's why we work on that. We oppose the Muslim ban. We try to uplift, uplift diverse voices. We do our best, but we have a long, long way to go, as Emily mentioned. Uh, so feel free to come to our website, peaceaction.org. Thank you very much. Uh, International Peace Bureau. Thanks, Lisa, for great doing a great job uh, facilitating. Um, happy Armistice Day, as we like to call it here, Veterans Day here in the U.S. Thanks again. Thank you, Paul. Yes, it is. 11-11-11 is uh, Armistice, the first, the end of the First World War, at 11 o'clock on the 11th day of the 11th month. And that was a little while, a little few hours ago. Thank you very much, all four of you. We started off with a lot of 
pessimism, but I come away, maybe it's just because I always like to look at the positive side of things, I come away with a lot of good messages, with a lot of hope. I come away uh, thinking that Biden is going to do his best to reinstate the United States role in the JCPOA. He's going to extend START, but that we knew. Maybe he will even do something about the INF Treaty. Uh, he's going to think about doing something on no first use, trying to get it, maybe. Uh, that despite the fact that there seem a lot of people think that there may be a proper coup, the way Pompeo announced that there's going to be a smooth transition from Trump one to Trump two, uh, the, the movements in the states have to protect the results campaign. And this is something very solid and something that can give us all hope and we can support, of course from here, there is going to be a reduction probably in sanctions uh, internationally. This, the, these are very, very positive elements. So I would like to thank you all. I would like to thank Reiner uh, and all the people in the Berlin office and my co-president Philip for having had this uh, idea to have this uh, webinar and for having organized it, and particularly Sean and Eskil and Julia in the Berlin office for having made it possible for us all to have such a good exchange. Thank you very much, and I look forward to the next time we talk to each other. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Yeah. Bye. Bye.